<laughs> and we are recording this so that our fellow league members and anyone else can understand and see it as well. Rhonda Whiting is a member of the Confederated Salish Kootenai Tribe. Her professional career has always focused on Native American development, including diversity and inclusion training, education, economic development, natural resources, energy development, and tribal participation in the political process. Ms. Whiting is a graduate of the University of Montana with undergraduate and graduate degrees in education and a Juris Doctorate from the University uh, School of Law. It turns out that Rhonda and Margaret were in law school together. So this is a small world we live in. This is wonderful. Ms. Whiting was the Assistant Administrator of the U.S. Business Administration from 1998 to 2000 and Vice President of Communications for the Salish and Kootenai Technologies from 2001 to 2003. She was appointed by Governor Brian Schweitzer to the Northwest Power and Conservation Council in 2004, and in 2012, became the first Native American to serve as chair of that council. Ms. Whiting worked for many years on political campaigns and get out the vote efforts, in particular for Jesse Jackson's campaign for president in the 1980s and Bill Clinton's 1996 campaign for re-election, focusing on the Native American vote. So please give a warm welcome to Rhonda Whiting. Um, 45 minutes all the way. Oh, that's we have questions. Okay, yeah, that's good. Sounds good. Um, my name is Rhonda Whitey. I have some of the um, introduction of who I am. Um, I'm going to show some pictures that I have of some different things and people that were involved in um, in the campaigns throughout the years. And um, the first one, now these, this is what we used in Washington D.C. It looks wore out. We okay. It's um. All right. This is a campaign thing that we used. Um, it's called Three Good Reasons to Vote, and we had um, we stole it from Alaska. They had two good reasons to vote, and so for the Bill Clinton campaign, we put this together. Those three little girls um, were on the Bison Range, and Kenny um, Kenny Blackford took the picture. And it's in the Cohen Museum, um, the picture itself, life-size picture of the girls. Um, two of the girls, the one in the middle is Taylor Urban, and her sister is over to her left, that's Erin Urban, and their grandma's here, Jennifer. <laughs> and that's my niece, uh, Katie Sprell, that's over on the other side of, uh, on Taylor. That, that went over really well. I'm just going to give you some of our experiences. Um, they had a meeting in DC of all the tribal chairs, and there was like 200 people with vice chairs and all of that. And they um, had invited um, the girls to come to that. That's when we first got it up. And Hillary Clinton was there as a speaker. And we were in the back holding room, and um, Taylor was kind of bursting around a little bit and her sister was getting on her case. And she slid down out of her chair and um, Taylor or Aaron said, Taylor, your panties are showing. Taylor was just all shook up and Hillary was there. And she walked in by that time and she went, that's okay, honey. And she just picked her up and put her on her lap. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was that was really good. And the highlight of the, the visit with the girls my sister took them and my uh, brother-in-law to DC was they got to go to the zoo. That was the most, <laughs> most fun part. So anyway, I've had some, been very blessed to have some really good experiences. Um, and I think I came from a political family. Um, my uncle, Satch McDonald, they called him Tom McDonald, decided to run for against Mike Mansfield for Senate. We were all kind of surprised. Um, but he um, he got 10,000 votes. We were totally shocked at that, and we, we know, knew he probably wasn't going to win. And he, this is his um, campaign poster, and it's my grandma lives across from the Mission Church in St. Ignatius, and this is a Mission Church. My grandma crossed that just not too long ago. These are my relatives. Um, Closer to the mic. 
I'm going to point something. You can pick up the mic. You can pick it up and okay. take it with you. Oh, yeah. okay. I think it comes out of there. It does. Oh, I see. Yeah. Got it. Hold it real close to your mouth. Okay. Um, these are um, my Aunt Florence, um, my Grandpa Johnny. This is an Esper's woman, and this is her, her brother. And this is my another aunt of mine. And John McDonald, um, he married, or Angus McDonald, when he came to Montana, he married Catherine, who was um, a relative or a niece of Chief Joseph. And that's where my family came from. My grandpa Johnny and grandma Liddy, and they're the ones that lived in the house across from the church, had 13 kids. And my grandma Mabel was one of those kids. And so we've always kind of been political. Another political um, icon for any country and up at Flathead is Bearhead Sweeney. He's my cousin. And there's a couple pictures of him. I wanted to kind of show you this is where it started. And this was at the powwow um, with cousins. And you can see Joe McDonald is in there. Some of you probably know him, Dan Decker. Um, Edith Swaney, uh, Wyman McDonald, a lot of our relatives, and we decided to, um, we had a feed and called it together, and I thought it was a good one just to show the growth of the family and um, some really talented people that have had the opportunity to do some professional things throughout their career. I'm going to Oh, and that's another one that some people might know. Um, of one of, I just wanted to show kind of our family's been political, and that's um, Bearhead Sweeney or Thomas Sweeney. And um, he was kind of always, he was very outspoken, very political, if any of you know him. Um, he was, but he was, um, he loved kids, and kids loved him. And as scary as he could be to adults sometimes, that he wanted to do his own way. Um, kids just were drawn to him. They just loved him. So I'm going to do the next one, I think. This is that That's him, what I said. And oh. that's my granddaughter, Adriana. Oh. And one of my favorite pictures wrapped up in a star quilt. And he loved kids and loved babies. But he was um, always looking out for kids and babies, and he was very outspoken. And he went to the convention. One of the convention in California before I had gone to a national convention, and so he um, he was politically active on behalf of Montana and those people that didn't have as much of a voice. So go ahead with the. And this is our powwow in um, Arlene, and that's the little girl that was on Bearhead's lap. She got big, Adriana, and um, then that's me with. Um, in front of my sister's TV that my buckskin dress on. Go ahead, just move on. And this is um, our family members. And one of our traditions with the family is that, um, as you know, the, um, the Salish people were moved out of the Bitterroot. And there's a place that we go and say prayers once a year. And you throw up a bundle and different gifts and do prayers there in certain songs. And at the top of that tree, I think it's going to be by lightning, it's kind of open and they'll go up and you'll see them hanging there. And right across the street is where they're filming Yellowstone. <laughs> so yeah, little Yellowstone signs there. Yeah, yeah. But um, those are my sister and cousins and stuff that were there. And, and we all go at different times. And every, there's no one set way that we do the ceremony, but there's older people like my brother-in-law kind of leads what we do, and that's him right there. That's my daughter in front of me and my granddaughter, Ebony. And um, so we all do it just a little bit different, and, but, we, but we think it's really important to kind of renew who we are every year and to go back there and to say first to the creator. And this is just, um, that's um, Adriana and Cecilia and Ebony. And we all of our kids go and they love to stay at the Palo. And um, so it, it's a really good family thing to have at the Palo. There was a time when people were able to um, drink at the Palo, and that was a nightmare. My Uncle Bearhead was the one that um, 
finally made that come to an end. And it was just a much better place to be, especially for kids and stuff. That he took a real strong stand on that, and I always appreciated that. Now, these, this um, is my sister, Anna Whiting Sorrell, myself, and Gwen, um, my daughter. Anna ended up being the um, director of the Department of Health and Human Services for the state of Montana. I was appointed by Brian Schweitzer to be on the Northwest Power Council, and Gwen was working for Senator Tester. But I have a little story about Ann. Um, we I was really a, a voting fanatic. And when Arnold Olson was um, running for a Congress, um, she was with me. I was always following her around. She was four years younger than me. And um, she, I think she must have been about eight, maybe. And so she was running around to have to put flyers on cars and stuff. So she was uh, pretty young when we started doing that kind of work. Um, and then the two kids that, uh, one, two of the kids, Katie and Aaron, were doing, um, they were putting out, um, posters and stuff for Bill Yellowtail. And they were out in the parking lot and it was up at the uh, steakhouse in Wilson, it used to be go -to's. And this guy came up to him and they said, do you want one of these? He said, yeah, I do. And they, he said, you know who I am? And they said, no, I'm Bill Yellowtail. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to see his campaign in action. <laughs> We get them out early. Um, I wanted to, you know, it, before I go into that, I wanted to read a couple of things. I had the opportunity to meet um, Paul Wellstone, who's the work that I was doing. And he said, I don't think politics has anything to do with the left or the right or the center. It has to do with trying to do the right thing by the people. Um, and so I was putting together um, a campaign plan for a company or for an organization that worked with Western Native Voice and all of the different pieces that you had to do. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of work. And so we talked about jobs and economic empowerment, affordable health care, educational access, fair and decent housing, voter registration, civic education, uh, election law reform, fairness in the media, fairness in the criminal justice system, political empowerment, affirmative action, and equal rights, gender equality, and environmental justice. Um, as we were doing this work, um, we put down, put together some things by saying, why did we vote? And so, let me find it. I've got an article that I put together, um, why should Native Americans vote? Some people say, oh, they don't let us be part of it anyway. Why should I vote? But we've worked really hard, and I think Flathead has kind of led the way. And um, the Indian vote has had a big impact throughout the time. So I'm going to read this to you. It was something that was published at one time. Civic engagement voting involves working to be effective in the civic life of one's community, developing the combination of knowledge, skills, values, and motiv motivation to make the difference. That means um, promoting the quality of life in the community through both political and non-political processes. And it always amazes me when people will say to me, I don't do politics. <laughs> well, if there's two of you in a room, you're doing politics. That's, that's, that's the reality. I always say, say, I hate to break it to you, but you probably are. <laughs> um, there's a fundamental right for all Americans, including Native Americans, even after the 1924 the Indian Citizenship Act became law. Unfortunately, some states can continue to um, prohibit Indians from voting. The state's argument was that the Indians were under guardianship of the federal government, and as a result, were not competent to vote and were not residents of the state. They lived on reservations. Many of these policies were overturned in the 60s. Non-tribal governments were often threatened to eliminate compromise, the hard fought for bargain for political status and legal rights of the tribes. Governments of all levels have been responsible for the broad range of laws that protect tribal sovereignty and native rights. The United States must be resp responsible to tribes for its legal promises, moral obligations, and past detrimental policies. In Montana, the Indian vote has been active for years. Some of you probably know Carol Juno. 
she was one of the gun mo that um you know she was she was out there all the time and her kids and different ones you know we've all worked together the indian boat played a really big role in the victory of pat williams in 1992. in 1992 montana lost one congressional seat leaving the state with only one congressional seat the election was between the anti-indian candidate ron marlin and the democratic candidate pat williams who was um, Congressman Williams was a friend to Indian people. He had played an instrumental part role in getting appropriations for tribal education, tribally controlled community colleges, and um, increased those kind of monies. And if any of you are familiar with community college, we have the only state that has seven community colleges, and they have done an amazing job of you know, getting education to people and, and bringing in different programs. Um, I'm working at the college right now. And Joe McDonald is my cousin too. So, um, you know, it's just been really, really good. And what's really ironic is that um, I'm working in the um, education department and doing the Native American studies portion of the stuff. And the dean is um, my little cousin, Mikey Munson, who's about 12 years younger than me. <laughs> um, so, back to the colleges, and they increased money and they, they've been threatened before to for the money to go away. but. It's, um, there, there's such a commitment, I think, for most counties where they have the colleges, truly believe in them at this point, they've really served a good purpose. There were, ever, there were over 7,000 new registered voters in 1992. William carried every Indian county in Montana except for Sanders, where he lost by 26 votes. All of the time, the general election, 22% of Montana Indian voters had registered and 16,000 voted for the, in the 1992 general election. The turnout increased the Indian vote by 43% compared to the general election. The Indian vote also played a role in the 1992 presidential race. Clinton won the state of Montana by 10,000 votes and attributed his victory to the Indian vote. In Montana, Clinton carried um, all reservation counties. Montana's reservation counted for 5% of Clinton's um, win in Montana. And um, I'm not sure of the, I don't have the stats on Obama or Biden's um, uh, numbers right now, but I wanted to kind of bring this to you and then talk a little bit about some of the major issues, why, how we can get people to vote. One of them was, and Mickey Pablo had worked for years when I worked at Tribal Eagle to get the buffalo back to the tribe and didn't happen and didn't happen, but this is really cool. Um, my daughter went to work for Fish and Wildlife. She went and she got her degree out of um, say the tribal the tribal college, say the Sydney College. And Bearhead's son was one of her best teachers, Bill Swaney. Um, she went to work for Fish and Wildlife. And she went to Missouri first, then she was in Nebraska, and then she got, got a call and they wanted her to come to Montana because they wanted to do the transfer and they wanted to do it with um, a, she's a descendant. And be able to do a really good transfer. So she was there for two years. And now Tom McDonald is the uh, chairman of the tribe. And he was the head of fish and wildlife um, for the tribe. And now we, we run the bison range. So that was a big unfortunately didn't see it, but those are some of the pavel buffalo that had come each year. So if you want to do the next year. I don't know how many of you guys have been up there, but it's really a nice, fun place to go. Another place where we played a major role was on Medicaid expansion. And that vote, uh, it tried to carry that quite a bit and it's made a huge difference in the state of Montana. And as you can see, there's um, Earl Olperson who just passed away about two months ago. Um, different tribal people that um, from across the state that came in, um, and sign that bill. So that was a big fight and it was great. So those are reasons why I'd like to bring it to the attention of tribal people and other people that your vote does count and it makes a huge difference. So go ahead. Um, and some of the good parts about doing in politics are that um, we've given the different ones that have come into the state a star quilt. And we don't do star quilts with flathead. It's more the, the um, tribal, um, uh, the tribal from the eastern part of the state plains tribes. 
and it's about um, being protected by the stars and stuff like that. And so we were lucky enough to be able to do that. Margaret Campbell was a legislator. Um, her and I, and there's a couple of stories I want to share with you about our, our why the vote became really, really important to us on a level of school boards. And um, then that's her daughter, Jennifer Perez um, Cole, who was the Indy coordinator for the state of Montana for Governor Schweitzer. Um, Margaret and I, um, when I moved to Harlem, Montana, I was teaching in Dodson and they wanted to do a Title IV program, which is the Indian Ed program for the Harlem schools. The Harlem schools had 89% um, Indian kids and they had, um, I think one maybe Indian teacher too. And they, um, they didn't treat people very well there. And so I went ahead and I wrote the grant, got funded. So when they were shocked when the grant came about, they had to sign it off, sign off on it, but they didn't think we'd get it. And so um, they, um, and I got my, Margaret hired. And the good thing about Margaret is that she's actually enrolled in, um, from Fort Peck, but she's lived at Fort Belknap all of her life. And her kids go to school there and she's tougher than nails. And so she knew all of the families and that was really beneficial you know, throughout our days of being there. And so they put us in the furnace room and the furnace room was up above the um, stage and it had a ladder that came down and you had to climb up it and there was a hole in the floor and pop up to the to our office. And it did have nice wooden floors. I don't know why they had those in there. They must have originally put them in there before the furnace or something. And there was no windows, it had cedar blocks, um, was part of the site, but we decorated up. We had a nice carpet, we had, you know, coffee, we had um, homeschool coordinators, and it just annoyed some of the people there that we had done that and made it worth our time. And so sometimes some of the examples were that there was a little boy that came in late for school and they were going to punish him. Margie knew that this guy guy came from a pretty um, from a family that had issues, and so he was probably getting up by himself to get to school, caught the bus by himself. And so Margaret said, "You know, you shouldn't double punish this kid. It's not his fault. I know some of the situations, and so for him to take the if he came in, he was late, and that's what he was in trouble for. If he took the steps to come to school on his own and got there, he should be rewarded for that." And they kind of, you know, kind of myth, were miffed at that, but they, you know, but we were able to monitor that. And since Margie knew all the families, I wasn't from there, my husband was, and so I didn't know the families as much as she did. And um, so then um, at one point in time, when we won't go to get supplies, I'd have to go down and talk to Elmer Stumiller, and I needed paper clips. He would count out 20 at a time to see how I do, and then I could come down and get more. <laughs> <laughs> and then we would ask the, the parents wanted to go to the school board meetings and I go down to talk to Elmer because he's the one that set the schedule and he said we don't know yet and I go down the next day he didn't know yet so next week and I finally said well what do you guys do just drive around in a car at random or what where do you guys meet at this is crazy well you know if those Indians come they'll raise heck and so they didn't, so they purposely did that, but we were kind of like monitors. So a lot of their fun things they were doing kind of got miffed, got messed up a little bit. And, um, and so we, we really stood our ground. Um, we got Billy Mills to come in. I don't know how many of you know who Billy Mills is. He's um, a runner, um, an athlete from South Dakota. He was the first Indian to win a gold medal. He was uh, um, raised, I think, by his grandma or aunts, but he ran and did all of the work himself. And what happens when he comes to give a um, presentation, he, first of all, it was expensive to get him there. So Margie and I got resourceful and we got him to go out to Hayes Lodge Pole. He went to Dodson, he was a Rocky boy, and I think he might even been in Malta. And, and, and so we all divvied up and he was willing to do it um, to, you know, to be there and it was wonderful. So when they were going to come, I said, well, we need the kids from the grade school to come over to the high school where we were, you know, our office was over in the furnace room in the high school. Anyway, so um, they said, um, why would we let those kids come over and see a Yahoo game like that? And I said, 
how many of you Yankees have got a gold medal in your lifetime? And I thought, you know, that it's not like they're going to fire me or they probably don't want to hire me back anyway. So I might as well be honest because I thought I said it. When he comes in, he, um, they show the film first of him winning the race. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's in black and white and it's kind of looks, you know, Brady or whatever it is, you know, and stuff because it's such an old film. And he's running and he's going to the lead and the announcer's about ready to faint. He's going, oh my God, Billy Mills is going to win. Billy Mills is really coming to the front. Billy Mills won. And um, the lights go on and he walks into the gym and the kids just about cry. I mean, it's just so moving. It's unbelievable. So we did, we did some good things there. The one best thing that I can say when I was applying for my job to work at the college is that if you've ever been in difficult situations, I explained a couple of those little situations that we were in. And I said, but we, you know, made it through and, you know, but now the best part of all is they built a new school in Harlem. And when they built the school in Harlem, um, they have a room that is specifically the Native American Studies room. <laughs> so I said, that was real good. <laughs> Yes, this is kind of a crazy little side story, but when you're in a school, those of you who have taught in a high school or grade school, you hear the bell ring and then you hear the feet. And so we heard the bell ring this one afternoon, but we didn't hear the feet. And we said, Margie, something's weird. And so she went downstairs and they had huge blizzards in Fort Dalham. They ended up with, you know, the blizzard, the snow drifts and everything. They let the kids out, but we didn't have a window at all. We didn't even know it was going on. So when Elaine Claiborne came in after me from Browning, first thing she did before they hadn't built new school was pulled out two of the cinder blocks and got a window in just in case of that situation occurred again. <laughs> so, um, and I remember, you know, they, that Emery Gray is kind of outspoken, really nice guy, worked for the BIA. And he decided he was going to whip up some signs when we were talking about, you know, voter registration. And his signs were a little bit, um, they weren't real sophisticated, let's put it that way. So one of the signs said, let's get those white guys off the school board. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it worked. <laughs> and we didn't get those signs in Harlem. They were out of the agency. <laughs> And so, you know, it made, made a big difference. And uh, that's why I always say, you know, why Indians vote. So um, I wanted to talk about, there was a, you know, about this article, you know, that, um, that I've written that it really does make a difference. A voice, that's your voice. And if you don't take the time to vote, you know, there's, you know, it's, the change isn't gonna happen. And in Montana right now, there, how many, how many reservations, does anybody know how many there are in Montana? Seven. Seven reservations and a new one um, with the um, the Cree, yeah. And um, so that's that's a new one. But also there's but there's much more. There were tribal people like Flathead, a Salish Kootenai, um, Fort Peck is a Cinnaboyan Sioux, and so um, now it's just like almost the norm that people get registered to vote and go out to vote, and that has made a a big big difference in those communities. So the work that you do, um, you know, it pays off in, in talking to people because before it was like, why do they do that? You know, and so I know that the power of the vote has made a huge difference. Um, and the money is out there a lot of times, you know, and the colleges have been one of the best organizations that we have, having one on each reservation and doing training and civic engagement and those kind of things, and then getting, um, and, and actually registering voters. And so now it's not even like it's kind of a new thing, you know, and stuff going out doing that. And people have fun and they enjoy doing it. So I think, you know, we, we started something big and I'm just happy to say that I was part of that. Um, and I have had the opportunity to do some amazing things in my life. Um, I think, um, you want to go to the next one? Sure. Um, I just got to figure out which one it is. Yeah. Let's try that one. Joe Biden. There we go. Oh. And so when I when I did the Jesse Jackson campaign in 1988, um, we had our campaign for the tribe was um, let's put red in the rainbow. And he came up to the Arley Powwow grounds, and he landed. And um, Marco Kidder was there because um, he landed in uh, Bozeman, and for some reason she wanted to get on the plane. I guess. Anyway, we um, and there was Secret Service there. 
we had 2,000 people at the Arlie Powell grounds. And my mom was there earlier and she'd been over across the street of the restaurant and these old guys were talking cowboys and they said, why in the hell is that guy coming to um, our league? He said, I don't know, I heard that um, one of his employees is a, a tribal member or something that I worked in his office or something. <laughs> anyway, so when they came in and, and what Earl Barlow sent down, I think it was two or four buses to, um, to the event. So a lot of kids got to go and the RLE school, they sent out a bulletin that said, dress dressy for Jesse. <laughs> and, um, and so then it was, you know, it was just a wonderful thing. And one thing that was really kind of frightening with that campaign was that, you know, Secret Service is there. They get there, you know, a couple of days earlier, a week early, and they sweep and do all this stuff. And so I was talking to him because I was in the back. And I, he said, you know, there's Marion Nation people here. I said, really? And he said, yeah. And he said, you want me to show them to you? I said, yeah. So we walked out, you know, kind of the side and he pointed out where they were at. And, you know, they knew exactly where they were at and what they were doing. So anyway, um, Secret Service does a good job. <laughs> but that was that was a big event to get that many people at, you know, the Arlie Powell grounds. And and as a um, part of that, I ended up being able to um, go to work for Bill Clinton for his um, second campaign. I was ahead of the Indian vote. And that's where we came up with the um, three good reasons to vote. And, and so that was, um, you know, really, really a good deal. And, um, and I got to meet a lot of people and they're still friends of mine. Then Bill Clinton was in Great Falls. I was coming back to Fort Belknap and got to see him. And then um, Joe Biden had come to the Mansfield Metcalf Center and we had the opportunity to see him. So we're getting more people into Montana and they all know about the Indian Falls. We've made sure that they pay attention to that. And, um, and stuff, so it's been uh, it's been a good ride. And it's been really fun. I like doing the book because I just think the end result is what the best part of the whole thing is. And like I said, when um, those little girls got to come to BC, that was a, that was a big piece of work. And that poster is all over the place. So, so I think unless you guys have some questions, I'm getting about down to the end of my presentation. So, any questions? You know, I'd have to look that 